is um, academically excluded. And oftentimes that is interpreted as a form of a bullying. So bullying is not because of this or this my humble anthropology definition. Bullying is not because a person is doing something. A policy can be a form of a bullying because the policy is written by a particular kind of institution that advances some systemic and, and structural injustice uh, 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 practices. So how do you test these things at, at that particular level so that when, when we have to unfortunately uphold exclusion or, or at least think different to what was initially pronounced as exclusion, what, what does that mean? So it's, 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 it's really interesting to hear the, the generic stuff. I want to bring it back to university. And, and test this notion that at, at, um, what, what the student is, is going through negotiating um, with, with institutional systems, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's a second question. Yeah, maybe, maybe I just have a comment here because I'm thinking about these things. Uh, whether democracy exists or it's, or it's just a myth, and then we see yes. Uh, if you look at, for example, from an electoral uh, perspective or political perspective, what the student I think you know outlined very well uh, in terms of proportional representation. If you look at the implication of wasted votes, and if you start assessing the questions, you know we we say we have democracy, but our democracy. Highest murder rate in the world, you know, poverty, uh, inequality, crime, we're not safe uh, anymore. And, and the idea, if you look at progressive thought on democracy, that the assumption was that it would create what Aristotle termed the good city or the good society or the, or the good uh, polity, uh, if you can use political jargon to address these issues that we see even going down to the court system where we talk about our judicial system uh, that we look at for example workplace bullying and we look at the 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 embedded uh, philosophical uh, challenges that you experience especially if you look at in terms of a new liberal model uh, on which these things have been based and doesn't make provision for social justice that we say yes yes you have rights so what? If you can't go to the court, you want to go to court, uh, what, then you get the region for the high court, 100,000 rand, uh, you look at the constitutional, look at the people that goes to the constitutional court. You need, in the region, you talk about the region of 1.3 million rand. Whose constitutional court? Whose court? For what purpose? And for what does it exist? And yes, we can say, this is the procedures, this is the processes, this is what we need to follow. But if it's not accessible to the people that needs it the most, when we talk about the, uh, the majority, marginalized, the poor, destitute, all these people that are alienated. So law exists for who, for what purpose, and for what? So, so ultimately, how do we address these systemic issues that centered on issues that we say, or is it just political rhetoric? or public rhetoric that we say, oh, we have all these things, it's nice, it's a pie in the sky, that's it. How do we address it on the ground that it affects the ordinary person on the street? The guy that walks there and says, listen here, I need to, courts needs to be accessible. You know, uh, I need to go, you go to the labor court, you can go through the CCMA, it's quite quickly. Then you find that you go to the labor court, you don't belong to a union, you don't have money. It costs you 100,000, the delays in the legal systems, it takes what to get the matter settled. Four years, you suffer in poverty, you don't get money, you don't get anything. So in any case, you can have this legislation, it means nothing if it, if it doesn't, you know, deal with the issues on the ground. So you can have these legislative frameworks, you can have these policies, you can have these processes, but it doesn't, if it doesn't affect then the person on the ground, then what does it mean? So that's probably just a comment. Thank you. Uh, is there any question again, so that I don't miss my colleague question at the back? Uh, just to add on what you said, my late colleague, uh, 
you almost touched everything to answer, but I just want to add again something. There was a presenter earlier who presented, I just forgot the title of the presentation. I think as I'm, I'm speaking now, the university have already advertised that uh, people from all the corners of South Africa or internationally, they must apply to come and study here. And presently, as I'm speaking, is the university trying to find out if those who comes here are going to be safe according to the Bill of Rights? Their dignity is going to be respected according to the Constitution. If not, I'm not saying the university that is not concerned about that. If not, they come in here and go and stay. There are several cases that are happening, but I see at least there are some uh, measures that the university have taken. is having shuttles and, uh, and others are protected because they have their own cars. What about those who don't have? Then it comes back to, are their rights being protected? And then let's go then to, uh, which there's another question, which I think there were two questions. Each and every university, have its own policies that govern uh, the whole community, which they should talk to the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. Coming to answer whether when the electoral system has been changed, if it has been changed, then it's going to align with the Constitution. But is it going to serve the needs of the students? Then it go back to my answer. I'm not sure when it comes to the Bill of Rights. Being contrary on this, and there's also in the Bill of Rights where it states clearly that each and every individual or each and every child has the right to free education or to education, not free education. And then when it comes to students, who've been admitted, or they have fees to pay for the previous years. Is it the university a place to consider whether you register with an outstanding fees or the university will say pay a certain amount of fees, knowing very clearly that the documents that they've submitted prove beyond any reasonable doubt that the income won't be able to cover that amount. And then the two contradicts, that is free, I mean, the, 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 the right to education, and then does the university provide that right to education or is it a capitalist institution? Uh, this is open to anyone, as I've indicated earlier, it's not only for me because that's what uh, we experience every day. Any comment? Yes, right at the back, there's a, a hand. Good afternoon, everyone. I sometimes struggle to articulate myself well, but I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Um, in the Department of Criminology, we normally analyze a lot of laws. As she has um, explained today that with every law she gave, there's always um, hiccups to the law that you need to follow certain, um, uh, how do I put this? You need to follow certain steps before you can take um, a decision. But how do you follow the steps if the employee is bullying you to a point that it's victimizing you within the workplace? That means that most, okay, with most South African law, there's always loopholes. Yes, the law protects you to a certain point. Right now, as much as it protects bullying under the Harassment Act, you need to withstand it until we have um, evidence to um, explain, to prove your point. But how do you withstand the conditions to a point that you actually have the tangible evidence? So in simple terms, the system is victimizing us to a point that you need to actually be there until you can prove it. If you can't, you end up being the victim of it. For example, with um, student uh, exclusion that Sir used, it's a thing of 
to what point is exclusion actually victimizing students? You can't be in the university system studying first year modules for four years while other students are struggling to get in, you're blocking the system. But if it's um, a financial issue, to a certain extent, it can be understood because some students, yes, they are being uh, victimized by NSFAS whereby it does not pay their fees, but the, the student has been receiving um, allowances throughout the year. But how do you advocate yourself if there isn't policies and laws advocating for you? Even though there are policies and laws, the university always has a stipulation to step into a certain point and say, but the agreement was between you and NSFAS. But at what point did you guys agree to give me um, allowances and everything. So my point with this is that with every law that protects us, there is always something they can use against us. So the system ends, ends up um, victimizing the person that's not supposed to be a victim in the scenario. Thank you. Uh, there was a second question from uh, from my little colleague in the back. Uh, do you mind uh, Mrs. Masia to, to answer first to that question? Thank you very much for the question. Um, that is the point of the study, to show that we have the laws that govern workplace bullying, right, and constructive dismissal, but are they really protecting us? Are they really protecting us adequately? No, because the, the process that we have to go through as the victims of bullying is very, very challenging. That's why I mentioned that it even brings emotional trauma. It's like, you, okay, let me make an example. There are most people out there that ended up resigning because they were bullied at work, right? But then do you know that most of them don't even know that constructive dismissal exists? Others even decided I'd rather not go through the courts because it has emotional trauma. I have to go through so much financially as well. You understand? So then they'd rather keep to themselves. So yes, the laws are there governing these things. But then the fact that the victims still have to be... Uh, to, they have to continue being victimized. It's a problem. It's not supposed to be like that. It's not supposed to be like that. So I don't know if I answered your question or if you need. They need to be amended. That's, that's why the International Labour Organization also holds these countries uh, responsible, the member states like South Africa. They hold them responsible to say, you have to make sure that the legislations are in alignment with the standards of the ILO. The ILO Convention number 190 was implemented in 2019, but still, it's like a few years later now, almost six years, but we're still dealing with the same South African laws that are not developed. So how, how, how much more do we have to suffer before we can be fully protected by the law? Uh uh, thank you. Uh, I don't think there will be other questions because of uh, because of time. Yeah, this seems to be interesting. Uh, it's supposed uh, 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 because now it's lunchtime. Uh, can I invite the program director with close remark to say thank you to my two colleagues and the the, the house at large. Thank you, program director. Was getting heated there. Um, thank you, Mr. Zanakele, so cute. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not say a word to keep you longer from lunch. So maybe kindly, maybe shorten it to 20 minutes instead of the initial time that we had. So if we can be back by 10 to 2, is that fine? Thank you very much. I <laughs> Thank you.
Anna. Anna, are you ready? Okay. Sure, you want to start? Mm. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I realize a lot of people are still outside, but in the interest of time, I would like us to continue. Uh, May Anna Muposho um, kindly ascend for the Faculty Health and Sciences. Let's kindly welcome May Anna. Thank you so much, Program Director. Um, on this short, but always whenever people like um, refers to me, they call me May Anna. And I'll be like, oh, I wonder if I was tall. Okay. Um. Welcome everybody. Um. I just wanna. I just want to get an indication online if, like, my occupational therapy students of and physiotherapy students, if there are any online, because like all my students are not here. They're busy like uh, with their internships. So outside the fountain, but like uh, both groups will be presenting online. Uh, the first group that I'm going to start with is the occupational therapy group. And then their, their supervisor, Ms. Annelies Kruger, she's here. She's coming to the front. Just for your moral support. Thank you so much, Annelies, for being here. Um, I don't think Jane Berman is here, but if she's not, it's okay. So like the first group that is going to give the presentation today is the occupational therapy students. As I've mentioned, like the supervisor is Annelies Krug. Okay. And then like uh, the student's name is Carla Jennings, Carla Van Standen, Kimberly Gemel, Kirsten Kemper, Melissa Prinslow, and Serena Lerums. So the ones that are going to um, give the presentation now is Carla and Kimberly. So if ever Carla and Kimberly are online, uh, after like the sessions, um, they, they're available to answer any questions that you, you, you guys might have. But like if ever they are not here, I think Annelies can answer like few. It's okay. Okay, so thank you so much. And then the title is Convention. Okay, fine. Let's go like this. The title is uh, Convention Validity of the UFS Enhanced Manipulation Assessment Instruments on Children Aged 3 to 4 Years in Prefontaine. Thank you, Anya. You can play your video. Utilizing standardized measurement instruments is well recognized within the field of occupational therapy. However, for an assessment instrument to achieve standardization, it must undergo a rigorous development process, ensuring its reliability and validity. Currently, the UFS in hand manipulation assessment <coughs> instrument is undergoing this instrument development process. In hand manipulation involves precise, refined movements, consists of six components, and is intrinsically linked to a child's ability to perform scholastic, self care, and play tasks. It shows a significant growth in skill and consistency after the age of three. Considering these developmental stages and the typical tasks performed by three to four year olds, it becomes evident that evaluating in hand manipulation skills is of critical importance. Informal screening activities are used due to the lack of in hand manipulation assessment instruments commercially available. However, these methods often lack evidence of instrument development or study supporting psychometric properties. At present, none of the 11 formal instruments described in literature meet the criteria required for in hand manipulation assessments, thus, highlighting the need for the development of a formal gold standard in hand manipulation assessment instrument. Such an instrument standardized on the South African population would enhance the reliability and validity of test results. To address this gap, the UFS in hand manipulation assessment instrument was developed, considering the assessment preferences of South African pediatric OTs. Instrument development is an extensive ongoing process where revision and refinement are necessary to ensure contextual congruence. The UFS in hand manipulation checklist was first developed in 2014, refined in 2016, and renamed as the University of the Free States in hand manipulation assessment instrument in 2019. Psychometric properties that have been researched thus far include construct validity and face and content validity. 
In addition, other studies that are currently underway at DUFS aim to investigate the test retest reliability, intra-rater reliability, and inter-rater reliability. convergent validity of the UFS in-hand manipulation assessment instrument in typical children aged three to four years in Bloemfontein. Convergent validity determines the extent to which two or more instruments okay. measure similar constructs. The two instruments compete with interstudy with the UFS instrument and the functional dexterity test. The UFS instrument contains 13 test items divided into two activities and assess all six components of in-hand manipulation. Also, the UFS instruments makes observations about the quality of task performance and the compensation strategies utilized. On the other hand, the FTT is a dexterity test designed to measure hand function when manipulating pegs on a pegboard. Dexterity is defined as the ability to use the hands in a skillful and coordinated manner to manipulate objects. The FTT focuses on accuracy and speed of task performance. The FTT was determined as the most suitable instrument to compare the UFS instrument against, due to it being standardized, providing pediatric norms, being psychometrically sound, and being commonly used by South African OTs. Moreover, it assesses two in-hand manipulation components and resembles the UFS flipping peg item. This study formed part of an overarching master's dissertation and followed a quantitative methodological study design. With regard to the population, there are 331 ECD centers in Bloemfontein, and it is estimated that 3,972 children aged three to four years attend these centers. According to the factor analysis method, Bornman was required to sample 300 children. However, for this study's objective, 50% of the overarching sample was included. To sample the ECD centers, convenient sampling was used where schools with a minimum of 10 children attending the centers were included. Thereafter, probability cluster sampling was used to identify a total of 40 ECD centers in Bloemfontein. However, only 19 ECD centers provided consent to participate. For the purpose of our study, children from 11 of the 19 ECD centers were assessed. To sample the children, a non-probability, non-proportional quota sampling was applied to the ECD cluster sample to select the test participants. Around one of the sampling, 102 were sampled. Thus, round two sampling was initiated, where 81 additional participants were added. Due to various reasons for ineligibility, 152 participants formed the final sample for this study. A pilot study was conducted on six participants, where after practical and logistical aspects were improved and show reliable and consistent data collection procedures. Over a period of three weeks, the trained researchers worked in multilingual pairs to combat possible measurement errors when testing. During test administration, hard copy score sheets were completed and thereafter uploaded to REDCap and Excel spreadsheets on the same day. Video footage capturing the child and administrator's hands were uploaded to Figshare for safe digital storage. Before the study commenced, ethical approval was obtained from the HSREC and DOE. Thereafter, all other relevant parties provided consent to participate. With the help of the Bias Statistics Department, descriptive statistics for categorical data were calculated. Thereafter, the median and interquartile range were used due to the skewed nature of the data. Associations were calculated using the signed rank test, which analyzes p-values. A p-value of 0 0.05 or less indicates a statistically significant difference, whilst a p-value of more than 0 0.05 indicates an association and hence convergence. The demographic profile included mostly female participants from registered ECD centers who had to suit to or other languages as a language of preference. The comparisons drawn within the study are here illustrated. FTT penalties were compared against UFS instruments compensatory strategies and quality indicators on the basis that they assess similar constructs. The FTT's time without penalty and UFS item 10 days time were also compared. Overall, FTT penalties were compared to seven UFS test items that assessed the same in manipulation movements, namely being simple shift and complex rotation without stabilization. In Table 1, the FTT penalties of touch board, other hand to adjust and drop peg dissociated when compared with the corresponding UFS instrument compensatory strategy. This discrepancy can be attributed to the fact 
that dexterity and in-hand manipulation are similar yet not identical constructs. However, when the FTT penalty of switch hand was compared with the UFS compensatory strategy of other body parts, four items demonstrated convergence. This indicates that both instruments have the shared ability to detect when a child does not have the appropriate inline manipulation skills to complete a task and thus makes use of a compensation strategy. Next, Table 2 indicates that when the FTT penalty of supination was compared against the UFS quality indicator of spatial orientation, two items showed association. Additionally, when the FTT drop peg was compared against the UFS control and grading of force, association was noted within the dressing game. From an OT perspective, it is sensible that these constructs were found to be similar since inappropriate force can result in a drop or inability to complete an occupation, such as fastening buttons during dressing. When the FTT penalty without time and the time of the UFS flipping pegs item A were compared, dissociation was noted. Despite the resemblance of these tests, this finding emphasizes the differences between the tests, such as differences in administration and scoring procedures, the size and number of pegs, as well as the size of the peg boards. Initially, the FTT was considered the most suitable instrument to compare the UFS instrument against on the premise of its resemblance and that dexterity and inline manipulation are closely linked constructs. This study now confirms that dexterity is different in inline manipulation. Similarly, the size of equipment as well as scoring and administration methods influence test outcomes, as the FTT scoring provides much numerical data, whereas the UFS instrument provides categorical data. Thus, these scoring differences between the instruments result in poor convergence being observed in the results of this research study. Hence, to reduce the dissociation, it is recommended that the UFS scoring sheet is adapted to incorporate numerical data. Other recommendations include performing a follow-up study on an older population to determine the conversion validity of the UFS instrument against the BOT2 test. Additionally, since the study was the first to be conducted in three- and four-year-olds, it is recommended that the wording of the UFS instruction manual is revised to cater to the linguistic needs of children of different ages. Following revision of the instrument, future studies can focus on investigation of other psychometric properties to further develop the instrument and assist it in achieving gold standard status. Despite evidence of some similarity between FTT and UFS test results, the overall lack of convergence implies that there is no standardized inline manipulation assessment instrument suitable for accurate comparison against the UFS instrument. This lack underscores the unique attributes possessed by the UFS instrument that can be utilized as a groundbreaking solution to address this gap. Ultimately, the refinement of this UFS instrument would provide a substantial contribution to the availability of standardized in manipulation assessment instrumentation within the context of pediatric occupational therapy in South Africa. Next, you can see our references, and we would like to thank everyone. Thank you so much, Annelise. Um, the next group that is going to, to present now is the group from physiotherapy. Uh, their supervisor is Jean, uh, Ms. Jean Wellman. Uh, seems like she's not here, which is okay. And then the students that are going to give the presentation is Hannah, Greta, Jaku, Marina, Mariska, Caitlin, and Nut Henderson. Uh, before uh, we can play their video, I first want to thank uh, Dr. Jeanette Seven, um, the head of uh, School of Nursing, for being here this morning. She came here to um, support all the students from the Faculty of Health Sciences we are going to present today. Uh, because of like other commitments, she couldn't be here this afternoon. But anyway, she said like um, she will join us online. So in her absence, I just want to thank her for availing herself and for showing up. Thank you, and I can play the video. My name is Caitlin Whittock and I'll be presenting our research on the associations between sociodemographic general health information and the emotional well-being of patients living with cancer in the free state. On part of the largest study of the health-related quality of life of patients living with cancer. 
Health related quality of life or HRQOL can be defined as an individual's perception of their current functional, physical, social, and emotional well being. Emotional well being, or EWB, is a domain of health related quality of life encompassing positive emotions like happiness and a cognitive aspect such as life satisfaction. The World Health Organization estimates that cancer prevalence will increase from 19.3 million to 30.2 million between 2020 and 2040. They also stated that in 2020, South Africa had the second highest cancer prevalence in Africa. However, no data regarding cancer prevalence could be found for the Free State. Cancer and its treatment cause symptoms and side effects such as cancer-related fatigue and pain, which affect patients' HR, QOL, and their EWB. Physiotherapists are skilled in the prescription of strengthening, aerobic, and breathing exercises, which improve patients' EWB and psychological resilience to their treatment side effects, as well as hopefulness about their condition. Research has also shown that patients with a better EWB had better recovery and survival rates. Literature shows that the EWB may be influenced by various factors. However, no literature is available to determine whether similar associations exist in our study population. Therefore, our study aimed to determine if there are any associations between the sociodemographic, general health information, and EWB of patients living with cancer in the Free State. A descriptive, cross-sectional study was conducted amongst patients living with cancer at Universitas Anne. The researchers made use of a convenient sampling method. Participants were required to meet the following criteria to be included in the study. The data was collected using a self-developed questionnaire about sociodemographic general health information and the Functional Assessment of Cancer Therapy General questionnaire, also referred to the FACG which included six questions regarding patients' EWB. G questionnaire included the following questions. The EWB score could range between zero and 24, where zero is the lowest and 24 is the highest EWB score. Both questionnaires were available in English, Afrikaans, and Southern Sutu. The study received ethical approval prior to commencing the pilot study and data collection. The biostatistician calculated descriptive statistics divided the EWB scores into quartiles and calculated the requested associations using chi-square and Fisher's exact tests. The following variables were identified as possible factors that could be associated with the EWB of participants and were thus used when calculating the associations. A total of 507 participants were recruited. The median EWB score was 18, where the scores ranged from 0 to 24 with the 25th percentile being 13 and the 75th being 22. With these values in mind, 122 participants were grouped in quartile 1 and thus had EWB scores between 0 and 13. 132 were grouped in quartile 2 with scores between 13 and 18. 117 were grouped in quartile 3 and had scores between 18 and 22. And lastly, 136 were grouped in quartile 4 with scores between 22 and 24. The age of participants with EWB scores increased from quartile 1 to quartile 3 but decreased again in quartile 4. Of the participants, 74.1% were female. The largest percentage of female and male participants had EWB scores grouped in the fourth quartile. The three types of cancers reported most among participants were breast, cervical, and prostate cancer. The largest proportion of participants with cervical or bone cancer had EWB scores between 22 and 24. 56.5% of the participants who were unsure about the type of cancer they had scored between 0 and 18. 68.2% of the participants diagnosed with lung cancer also scored between 0 and 18. The greatest number of participants receiving chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery had EWB scores in the fourth quartile. The largest percentage of participants who did not know what type of treatment they were receiving had EWB scores below 13. 55.6% of those not receiving any treatment had scores below 18. The largest proportion of participants who were diagnosed longer than two years ago or within the last year had EWB scores in the fourth quartile. 
whereas the greatest number of those diagnosed in the last month had EWB scores in the first quartile. In our study, no associations could be established between the socio-demographic general health information and EWB of patients living with cancer in the free literature suggests that emotional and psychological well-being are similar topics and the research is regarded as, as such. The median EWB score of the current study was close to the scores of patients with cancer in Canada, where it was 17, and in India, 20. No studies could be found about the EWB scores in South Africa. To research, older patients have better EWB as they might have better resilience and coping skills. However, this was not supported by our study's results as the median age of the participants increased as the EWB scores increased but decreased again, negating a possible link. A lot of research shows that females have worse EWB scores. However, the current study's results also did not show a clear link to support this. Although literature suggests that intimate relationships are the primary source of patients' EWB, we are of the opinion that one's marital status is not a reflection of the level of intimate support one receives, possibly being a reason why no association could be established in our study. There was no clear link between the highest level of education or employment status and the patient's EWB scores. These findings were both supported and negated by previous studies. The results seem to indicate that a large proportion of patients with cervical or bone cancer had better EWB scores, whereas a greater proportion of patients who had lung cancer or those who were unsure of the type of cancer they had, had lower EWB scores. A previous study, similarly, found no significant difference between cancer type and EWB. Current studies showed that a larger proportion of patients receiving chemotherapy, radiation or surgery had better EWB scores. Conversely, more patients who were unsure of the type of treatment they had or those who did not receive any treatment had lower EWB scores. There might be a link between a higher EWB score and a longer time since diagnosis. This was supported by other studies that state that patients had bigger emotional burden in the initial stages of the condition with a lot of treatment side effects, which lowers the EWB. Amputations of the study have to be noted. Considering the absence of normative data for the South African cancer population, the comparisons of the FACG scores in the Free State to that of other countries might not have been as appropriate. No research could be found regarding the validity and reliability of Afrikaans and Southern Sudu FACG questionnaires. The questionnaire took longer to complete than anticipated, which might have led to participants losing concentration or becoming fatigued, causing them to give less thought to the last few questions, which were about EWB. Lastly, the participants had difficulty understanding the scores of the five-point Likert scale of the FACG, which could have influenced their response. The researchers recommend that further research should be conducted to validate the self-developed questionnaire and the Afrikaans and Southern Sutu versions of the FACG questionnaire utilized in our study. In order to accurately interpret the HRQOL and the EWB scores in the South African population, research should still be conducted to determine the normative data. Qualitative research design should be considered to provide research with deeper insights into the EWB of patients living with cancer. Literature has shown that physiotherapists are able to improve the EWB of patients living with cancer through exercise interventions. However, further research must determine which physiotherapeutic interventions are most effective in improving the EWB of patients living with cancer. Health-related quality of life assessments are being used more commonly worldwide to optimize the health-related quality of life and EWB of patients living with cancer by tailoring the medical interventions to suit their needs. Although no associations were found, some factors seem to negatively affect the EWB. In order to optimize the EWB of patients living with cancer, physiotherapists can implement various treatment interventions. Therefore, the role of physiotherapists as part of the multidisciplinary oncology team should be promoted amongst healthcare practitioners in South Africa. We would just like to thank the following individuals for their contribution to the study. Thank you for listening. Here are our references for this presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Um,
Now I think I'm going to open the floor for the questions of which Mr. So to ask me if I'm going to stand in for my students to answer questions if they're not, they were not here, then I said, like, no, not me. I'm not going to answer any questions. So luckily my students are online to answer any questions that the floor might have for them. Any questions? Thank you for the good presentation and for the faculty and of medicine and health. May we pose the question direct to you, Mrs. Bumposh? No, no. Oh, okay. Our director, she has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mine is not a question as such, but it's a comment. Uh, I think these presentations are really an eye opener, especially to us members of a society. Uh, some of us we have experienced a cancer in our families and, 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 and knowing that our university is involved to, to this extent. I mean, our university needs to be really commended for this great work of engaging the community to find a better solutions, especially in, 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 in healthcare of our respective communities. So I'm, I'm, I just wanted to say, I'm really applauding the, the students for this great work that they have done. Even including the first uh, presentation, I'm just excited. So I'm looking forward to us having the, the project and putting them on our groups is caller. Who knows? Maybe somebody overseas will say, let us collaborate on this topic. So then it's a big opportunity for the university. Thank you. Thank you, Sis Jay. Um, I just want to ask if maybe Annelise, she's one of the lecturer or occupational therapy, she was one of the supervisors for the group. If maybe she wants to say something, if she has comments or something. Good day. Yes, I would like to actually just add on your comment. Thank you for that kind comment of um the, the role that the students play, both groups, in just making the awareness of the work that is being done at the university um, more visible. I'm thinking of uh, our own students that is assisting in building the steps needed for us to really just develop this instrument that has um, got its roots at this university and it's being pursued now and being finalized by another master student. And the more that we know about this, um, the more interest it attracts for further research to be done. So thank you just for that acknowledgement. And I also want to just commend the physiotherapy uh, students also on looking at something so complex like um, emotional well-being and not um, shying away from also seeing what makes it unique within our context. I, I quite enjoyed seeing the differences between the Canadian um, population and how it differed in our setting. So it just re-emphasizes African studies needs to be um, taken yeah, seriously. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Annelies, for that. And thank you for the support that you've shown. Um, I just want to check if, like, uh, Mr. Malakudi, uh, if Jane, um, Jane Berman is online, the supervisor for the physiotherapy, because I believe that like uh, she said she will attend online, if maybe she wants to say a word of two. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity for my students to be able to present their research and well done to Annalisa's group uh, the occupational therapist, it's always nice to, to see actually for the whole day to see what types of uh, research projects our university students are engaging with and 
to which extent they um, involve uh, people in our community and how we can maybe uh, collaborate with people across uh, some campus. Um, I must say that this cancer research um, that we started doing with the students, um, what you just saw was just part of a little part of the research that was being done. So all the students had to uh, take part in uh, research on cancer patients because what we have noted is that it's actually one of the fields where physiotherapists can do so much and we are not doing that much um, because of the fact that people feel like um, they're scared of uh, doing something if there's a cancer patient involved. Uh, they're not really sure what to do. So we would like this to inform um, other people in the world and other people in South Africa especially because as part of the multidisciplinary oncology team, we have not been uh, the prime uh, participant in those teams and we are trying to become more involved in cancer research. So we're actually starting up a hub at the, uh, at the Department of Physiotherapy and um, starting to involve both the students as well as the postgraduate students in this hub so that we are all busy with the same type of research because there is really limited research that has been done in physiotherapy and cancer. Um, and I also think one of the things that, that could maybe be done that I really liked about what the students said was that we now need to involve the stakeholders, the ones with the cancer, the ones that have the cancer, the family members of the patients that have um, cancer or that are struggling with these um, after effects or side effects of the treatment that has been um, provided to them. And if we can then find out or dig deeper into what their needs are and what the things are we are struggling with, then uh, we can support them in a much better way. So thank you so much for the opportunity for our students to be able to um, showcase their research. And um, well done to all the groups that have presented so well today and that have given us insights into all the research that is being done around campus. Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, if there are no, any other questions from the floor, uh, I would like to say thank you and then hand over the mic to the program director. Thank you. Um, I don't want to say me Anna anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for that session. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the last session before the actual last session. And that session is the Economic and Management Science Faculty. And it will be led by Mr. Mulatudi Sepoko. May we kindly, is he here? Yes, he is. May we kindly welcome Dr. Sepoko. Looking good? Thank you. Thank you, group. Thank you, program. Saving the best for last. <laughs> yes, uh, the presentation, we have three presentations from EMS, especially from the Department of Public Administration and Management. And I see um, Mr. Duplessis is here. Um, Dr. Davazwa Maramura is here. Dr. Mahir is here. And can you please come forward before I call the, the students who are going to present? I'm <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, before I start, uh, let me first uh, quote uh, Margaret Feller saying that if you have knowledge, let others light their candle in it. Unquote. For us to acquire knowledge, we need to study. And then for us to acquire wisdom, we need to observe. So I will call our first presenter. The topic is exploring the influence of load shedding on the water governance in the Mangaung Metro Municipality. The paper will be presented by Christopher Stridon. And I have learned that this paper was presented in the conference. Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. So I will be presenting out of my honors research that was done with Maria Bade, Tato Chabalala, under the supervision of Dr. Maramura. It is titled Exploring the Influence of Load Shedding on Water Governance in the Mangaung Metropolitan Municipality. So the introduction to the topic is that Infrastructure is an integral component for effective water governance. Without functioning water and electricity infrastructure, water governance in the Mungo Metropolitan Municipality would be hindered. And load shedding prevents water infrastructure from operating effectively because without electricity, wastewater treatment facilities can't operate continuously. And this in turn disrupts the stable supply of potable water to residents, which then also negatively impacts water governance in the municipality. So then the background and rationale to the study. So firstly, the municipality is the most populous municipality in the free state, and constitutionally, it is obliged to provide water and sanitation services to its residents. And in the case of the Mangu Metropolitan Municipality, Bloomwater is the water services authority that is responsible for ensuring that good water governance also takes place and that the effective management of water services takes place. And this entire situation um, is complicated by the municipality being in a semi-arid region that has an annual rainfall of 450 milliliters of water compared to 500 milliliters of water, which is then the national average. And then there's also other factors that constrain water service delivery in the municipality, such as drought, aging infrastructure, lack of infrastructure maintenance, population growth, as well as non-revenue water losses. So load shedding then has just exacerbated the challenges faced by the municipality because it prevents water treatment facilities from and pumping stations and the water supply system from functioning effectively. Hence, we said that water is not only just lost as a resource, but also as an economic commodity. Therefore, if load shedding continues, MMM will not be able to deliver water services sustainably, and it will also mean that good water governance does not take place. And this will also then result in the municipality not meeting its obligations under the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 6. Then the research problem of the study was that, according to Chapter 2 of the Constitution, water or access to water is a fundamental human right. And despite this, the residents in the municipality have faced too many water supply interruptions. And this supply interruptions can be attributed to all that unmaintained water pipes, low water supply system pressure, caused by load shedding. So in the municipality, essentially water shedding has been implemented, which just means that the water pressure is cut off in the water supply system, preventing water from being pumped to certain neighborhoods. That's why higher lying areas would go without water for longer, and they would also be cut off first. Then the research aim and objectives of the study. The study's aim was to explore the influence of load shedding on water governance in the Mangung Metropolitan Municipality. And the, the objectives were then firstly to establish the influence of load shedding on water governance in the municipality, to determine how load shedding has influenced the infrastructural ability of the municipality to have good water governance, and then also to recommend implementable strategies to improve the relationship between load shedding and water governance. Then the significance of the study, the study was significant because load shedding is an issue that is caused by the national sphere of government. Now, the national sphere of government is responsible constitutionally for the generation of electricity. 
whereby the municipality is responsible for water service delivery. So there's a disjunction between the two because you cannot have water service delivery without electricity. Therefore, a, a problem caused by one sphere of government has then spilled into another sphere of government. And despite this, the uh, municipality is still expected to provide water services and to have good water governance. Then on to the literature review, we first established the influence of load shedding on water governance. We established that electricity is central to the functioning of the water industry because it is needed for pumping, the treatment of raw water, distributing water, and collecting and treatment of wastewater. And electricity is then also used in the water supply system to create pressure within it so that water can be pumped throughout the system from low-lying areas into higher-lying areas. Therefore, we say that load shedding prevents all of this from taking place because it's a very simple principle. Without electricity, your pumps and your equipment cannot function. Therefore, the water supply system can also not function. Then in our literature re review, we looked at um, international solutions, regional solutions, national solutions, and then also at the local case study. So at the international level, the Nepali government has resorted to using renewable energy uh, sources to address its energy insecurity. And among this, it included wind, hydroelectric power plants, solar panels, and biogas plants. And it was able to use solar panels to address its energy insecurity, which was then able to power the water supply system. Then at the regional level, in Zambia, the government has resorted to installing large portable water tanks in each neighborhood, which, which would then first fill up when there is power, and they would act as a backup storage tank for times where there is load shedding there as well. Then in the national level, the Cedarburg municipality has purchased water and sewage storage tanks to ensure continued water service delivery. So basically, they would allow water to be stored in big tanks for when load shedding takes place. Then they could just pump the water out of the storage tanks. But also, when load shedding does take place, you have sewage flows that could possibly take place. So now, instead of the sewage spilling out of the water supply system, it goes into the sewage storage tanks. Then at the local level, the municipality is currently busy constructing a new reservoir in Pellisir that will also minimize the pressure on the water supply system because um, all of the assets of Bloom Water are currently providing 69% of the municipality's water supply. So they are overburdened. They, they are, they, there's too high of a demand for the current supply. Then the theory that we used, one of them, was integrated water resource management. And the reason why we use integrated water resource management is because according to the National Water Act, the country is obligated to implementing integrated water resource management. But then also South Africa is a signatory to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 6. And it also advocates for the implementation of integrated water resource management in um, countries around the world. Now, what is integrated water resource management? It refers to water management that balances the competing demands of human consumption, the economy, as well as environmental sustainability. And another reason why we chose integrated water resource management is because it could accurately describe the inherent water energy nexus that is present within the research problem. Then we also looked at the theory of good governance, since um, it does come down to a management issue. So firstly, good governance requires the government to be responsive to the needs of the citizens and to also be effective in the execution of its programs and policies. And we established in the literature review that the South African government has not implemented good governance because it was warned in 1998 in the white paper on the energy policy of the Republic of South Africa that we would run out of generation capacity by 2007. And despite this warning, the government only started constructing the Medupi and Kasuli power stations after load shedding has already started in 2007. Therefore, it has taken a reactive approach, highlighting that poor governance was already present in the government. And another point just to highlight the degree to which poor governance is taking place in terms of water is that out of 824 wastewater treatment plants, only 60 are fully operational and providing municipalities with safe drinking water. And also, according to the infrastructure report cards, our infrastructure has very low scores. So national water resource infrastructure has scored a D, urban infrastructure scored a D minus, and bulk regional infrastructure scored a C plus. 
And this is the scorecard that was used in um, the source that we consulted. So then why did we use two, series, two theories? Because they speak to the management of water as a resource for service delivery in local government. And then good governance speaks to the maintenance aspect of energy and water infrastructure. So it allows us to capture the essence of service delivery as mainly being a maintenance one. That is what the issue comes down to. Then for the research methodology, our research approach was a qualitative desktop study that, in, that then used an exploratory case study design. And the research philosophy that was used was interpretivism. And then the data collection method, the study was a desktop study. So we only, only make use of secondary data sources and data analysis was done according to thematic data analysis, which was then done using the six step process of familiarization, coding, searching for themes, reviewing themes, refining and naming themes, and then producing the report. And then this is just to show to you the different themes that we developed out of the different codes that we got as well. And then the analysis, the analysis was done by linking each research objective to a relevant theme. So we clustered them together. But then also note in our analysis, we could not find any primary studies to affirm that there is an influence of load shedding on water governance in the Mangum Metropolitan Municipality. So we had to consult other sources, such as Cedarburg Municipality, as well as the Langebaard Municipality and the city of Tuan. Now, firstly, the analysis and discussion of data uh, under objective one, which was to establish the influence of load shedding on water governance in MMM, we established that there is a water energy nexus because without electricity, grey water cannot be pumped to and from water treatment facilities, causing wastewater to build up in the MMM because of load shedding. Secondly, the disruptive influence that load shedding has on water governance in the municipality means that integrated water resource management cannot be effectively implemented. This is because load shedding disrupts the flow of water in the urban cycle, and it can be deduced that this negatively impacts supply and demand management in the natural water cycle, thereby negatively affecting water governance in the municipality. Thirdly, the government has induced energy insecurity by reactively building the Madubi and Kusile power stations. Hence, it has also then induced water scarcity because you need electricity in order to provide portable water to residents. Then the second objective, which was to determine how load shedding has influenced the infrastructural ability of Mangung Metropolitan Municipality to have good water governance. Firstly, we deduce that load shedding temporarily holds the purification and pumping of water in the municipality. And it does this by preventing your water treatment plants, water supply systems, and booster pumps from functioning. Secondly, the Brandkop Reservoir needs electricity to pump water from the Valbrach pipeline through the water supply system. So load shedding then causes the water supply system to drop, making it impossible to provide residents in high-lying areas with water. And the Valbrach pipeline provides up to 70% of the municipality's water. Then it can also be deduced that the water infrastructure in the municipality cannot operate sustainably based on the consideration of water shedding and water shifting as water management strategies to combat the effects of load shedding. Then in the context of the municipality, the infrastructure report cards also indicate that um, its water infrastructure was already rated as being poor. So we can say that load shedding has only exacerbated the poor quality of the water infrastructure. So water governance was not good to begin with. It, uh, load shedding only makes it worse. Then the third objective, to recommend implementable strategies to improve the relationship between load shedding and water governance. Firstly, the issue caused by a lack of electricity can be addressed by using renewable energy sources, like drawing on the Nepali experience, solar panels were able to meet the energy demands of their water supply system. And in addition to this, a battery storage solution also must be implemented to store available electricity when there is not load shedding. Then the lack of infrastructure maintenance has compromised the ability of the municipality to practice good water governance. And the municipality must co collaborate closely with the water utilities focusing more on urgent repairs to take place and also to improve their maintenance protocols. Then conclusion and recommendations. So the study revealed that load shedding does have a negative influence on water governance in the Mangu Metropolitan Municipality. And this is caused because there is a lack of electricity to power the pumps in the water supply system, as well as your water treatment facilities. So in order to address this, the municipality should firstly 
allow households with rooftop solar to sell excess electricity into the grid. Secondly, it must invest in battery electricity storage, which would then allow the municipality to electricity when there is a stable supply of it. Therefore, when it is load shedding, it can just use the stored supply to power the water supply system. Then, Bloomwater should also roll out solar farms at its wastewater treatment facilities, which would then have the necessary capacity to power its operations. And if this is not cost effective, Bloomwater should at the very least use diesel uh, generators to power the wastewater treatment facilities over the short term. Then MMM should also then advocate for water usage awareness by informing the public that the influence that load shedding has on water governance in the municipality. Then we also identified future areas for research. So firstly, the feasibility of using renewable energy provided by households um, that have solar panels. So this area should be further explored as a possible solution to the current water issues that the municipality faces. And also a future study should also be conducted exploring the influence that load shedding has on the quality of potable water. And then finally, a primary study should be conducted on the influence of load shedding on water governance in the municipality. And then here's our references if you want to consult it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And then our next presentation is uh, abortion. Is abortion right or wrong? And then it will be presented by my major and Peters. It's a recording. Good day, everyone. My name is Nisiho Peters. And I'm Makoma Yenja. And for our assignment, we had to write a position paper on a topic of our choice. The topic that we chose was abortion. Are abortions right or wrong? Good day, everyone. My name is Nisiho Peters. And I'm Makoma Yenja. And for our assignment, we had to write a position paper on a topic of our choice. The topic that we chose was abortion. Are abortions right or wrong? So, what is an abortion? An abortion can be defined as the termination of a pregnancy by the removal or expulsion of an embryo or fetus. It's an act of deliberately ending a pregnancy so that it does not result in the birth of a child. It's, this act was fairly common and did not have any controversy up until the 19th century. The recent controversy regarding abortions touch on the moral, legal, and ethical aspects of it. These aspects then led to two distinct positions forming, which are pro-life and pro-choice. Pro-life are people who are against abortion, and pro-choice are people who are for abortion. So, what is I'm assuming that we've all heard of the slogan, My Body, My Choice. This slogan is mostly used in issues surrounding body autonomy, and it is used by those that support abortion, which are people who are pro-choice. They believe that women have autonomy over their body, which includes their reproductive autonomy. This means it is the right to decide whether they want to have a baby and to have the option of doing an abortion. For them, Abortion is a personal choice, which is legal, justifiable, and safe.
For their belief, they forget that a fetus is not an organ of a woman's body, but rather an organ an organism living in a woman's body. This means that although a fetus is in a woman's body, it doesn't technically mean that the fetus is a part of a woman's body. Their autonomy has limits. They can do whatever it is that they want to their body, but to a certain extent. Furthermore, <laughs> supporting a practice simply because it is legal is absolutely absurd, since the law is ever changing. Take for example, apartheid. Racial segregation in South Africa was legal, but that doesn't mean that it was right. Using the law to, to try to justify abortions is absolutely thoughtless. This is because abortions are done for shallow reasons, such as um, putting your career first, and not wanting to be a single parent. For, for their belief, they forget that the reality is that abortions are wrong because an abortion is murder. It ends the life of an innocent baby that has the right to live. In fact, it can be said that life begins at conception because the moment fertilization takes place, the baby's genetic makeup is completely established. What its gender is going to be, along with its height, hair, and skin color, have already been established. Furthermore, research has stated that in the 10th week of pregnancy, the baby has detectable brain activity and a beating heart, which means that they can feel pain. And knowing that an abortion ends the life of the fetus, it can be said that they are dreadfully painful for the fetus, because how can being murdered not be painful? The, the reality is Despite the fact that we are in the best era of healthcare, abortions are not without their risks. Studies have connected a higher risk of getting cervical and ovarian cancer to abortions and have also found that the trauma that is caused to the uterus during an abortion can make it difficult to conceive in the future and might even complicate the future pregnancies of women. Furthermore, women have also reported experiencing feelings of profound regret and guilt after an abortion, with conditions like post-abortion syndrome being very common among them. Even though post-abortion syndrome is not recognized as a real condition by many medical organizations, there's no denying the fact that abortions are an unsafe practice that has left many women with psychological implications that are just as important as the physical effect of abortions. Overall, abortions will forever be a long-term controversy. Everyone has different views about what is right and wrong, so no one may fully agree as to whether abortions are right and wrong. Our position as to why abortions are wrong touch on the moral and ethical aspects about it. One should question as to whether abortions are as safe as they need to look, and if the reasons mentioned are good enough to justify an abortion. Whichever way you may look at it, the underlying question is clear. How can something that leads to the painful death of a person not be wrong? Thank you. Uh, our last presentation it's on should the sale of recreational cannabis be legalized in South Africa? And then the presenter is Mr. Boyant. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Zane Boyant, and today I shall be discussing a positional paper that myself and fellow students had written last year uh, during our last semester at the University of the Free State. The purpose of a positional paper is to debate a controversial topic, starting with the background or introduction with a brief history as well as an opening statement, followed with the argument against, uh, as well as refuting statements, and then the argument for. 
with supporting statements and a conclusion. The sources used are journals and articles, while the referencing style was Harvard or APA 7. Without further ado, should the sale of recreational cannabis be legal in South Africa? Now, it's important to keep in mind that cannabis has been illegal in South Africa since 1922 up until 2018 when it was decriminalized. Now, the original reason for it being criminalized uh, was due to an international convention held in 1922 where several countries had decided to ban the use of the substance, among other drugs. At the time, this was the most uh, effective way to combat the war on opioids. However, over time, most countries have changed their stance. For example, the Netherlands has legalized cannabis in 1975. Portugal has decriminalized cannabis in 2001. America on a state level has legalized cannabis in 2012. Canada has legalized cannabis in 2018. While South Africa decriminalized cannabis in 2018, it is yet to legalize the substance fully. And most recently, Thailand has legalized cannabis in 2022. Considering the reasons why cannabis sales should be legal and why the sales should be legal, this paper will disprove the arguments against cannabis legalization and provide supporting reasons why cannabis should be legal for adults in South Africa not only for medical purposes, as it already is, but for recreational purposes, which in turn will provide several benefits. In essence, this paper supports the legalization of cannabis in South Africa. The sale of recreational cannabis in South Africa should be legal. The reason being that cannabis sales allow drug cartels to generate net profits. A news article from Malero and Bloomberg in 2023, found that a seizure of about 7,000 pounds of cannabis in the United States had an estimate of $28 million in value. However, marijuana legalization in Colorado and Washington has cost the Mexican drug cartels an estimate of $2.7 billion in profits. While this information shows that black market cannabis sales are profitable, the legalization would have an immense impact on the drug cartel's ability to profit. The reason being that they would have to start complying with tax or paying tax on every product that they sell as well as paying for their employees or documenting their employees' payments. Furthermore, marijuana is harmful to the health of the individuals that use this substance. As proven, research shows that smoking one marijuana joint is as damaging to the lungs as five tobacco cigarettes. Now, it's important to keep in mind that while cannabis is harmful compared to drugs such as tobacco and alcohol, the death toll is quite insignificant. Roughly 20,000 people die from tobacco use per year. This is now in South Africa. And roughly 62,000 individuals died in died from complications related to alcohol in 2015. Again, in South Africa. While a comprehensive study from 1998 to 2020 or 2021, uh, Copeland et al. found that 3,455 persons had cannabis in their systems upon death. Only 136 of these cases had cannabis in their system, had only cannabis in their system, while only 14 of these cases found that cannabis was used before death, and only one case found that cannabis was the underlying cause and immediate cause of death. Here are some figures that I'm going to show you. The figure on your left will show alcohol as having the highest death toll, tobacco second, and cannabis third. The figure on your right will show you the reported number of deaths and their increase over the years of the study. 
And lastly, on the bottom, uh, this would demonstrate the reported deaths related to alcohol. The top is cannabis and the left is all three. Now on the bottom, we've got your males and your females, as well as their relevant age groups and level of risk. Lastly, we look at cannabis as a gateway drug. An article by Williams is stated that the consumption of cannabis by the youth functions as a gateway drug to more extreme substances such as opiates. However, given the fact that Pelzer et al. stated that globally cannabis is the most commonly used drug, should there not be an increase in the use of hard drugs globally if cannabis is really the so-called gateway drug? In fact, research by Williams in 2020 has stated that other risk factors associated with the development of substance use disorders include biological factors, mental characteristics and their symptoms, and the social factors that affect health, as well as a combination of high-risk genes that actively increase the risk of uncontrollable drug use. Therefore, it is not necessarily cannabis that is the gateway drug, but the use of any substance, including tobacco and alcohol, with the combination of various factors that lead to the use of hard drugs. In terms of the sale of recreational cannabis in South Africa being legalized, we would look at the South African Police Service budget implications. In 20 14 to 2015, a stupendous 3.5 billion rand had been expended on cannabis-related prosecutions, while the street value that was seized was only up to 1.5 billion rand. Now, given the fact that the money is spent on pro prosecutions could be utilized to benefit other government projects, such as development of railway systems, prosecution of more serious crimes, such as rape, murder, corruption, human trafficking, or even delegated towards basic service delivery. The potential relief on government spending and benefits of job creation in terms of being able to legally sell recreational cannabis and its revenue collection possibilities that the government could implement. The legalization would only benefit the South African economy. In terms of looking at minimizing health risks and alleviating potential uh, threats imposed on health services, South African citizens are permitted to grow, consume and give away cannabis with very little regulation. Now, when it goes unregulated, there is a higher chance for harmful chemicals to affect users, as well as poor cultivation or storage can also negatively affect the user. With the legalization, strict cannabis control regulation policies can be put into place to minimize potential health risks, harmful chemicals or mold might have on the user and alleviate the potential threats it might impose on hospitals that would have to deal with said issues. Lastly, we look at the economic growth benefits. Recreational cannabis sales would be advantageous to the tourism industry. Hence, Matiza in 2023 cited O'Connell, arguing that the commercialization of hemp-based substances, apparel, and food items would assist in creating significant opportunities for economic growth. Now, to unpack this, this would be the creation of clothing, shoes, uh, food items, uh, CBD oils, etc. Furthermore, Matiza mentioned a growing market of cannabis cultivation farm tours, as well as cannabis-friendly hotels across South Africa. Considering that enthusiasts would engage in these tours, try these foods, stay at these hotels, the opportunity for cannabis tourism and its revenue from not only the cannabis industry, but the tourism, hotel, restaurant, and food and beverage industry would ultimately be beneficial to South Africa. Let us not forget our manufacturing industry as well. In conclusion, 
the way forward is to fully legalize the sale of cannabis to adults for recreational and medicinal purposes in South Africa. While medicinal sale is legal and regulated, recreational sale should follow a similar process. Taking into account the economic benefit that could boost the gross domestic product of South Africa, the potential benefit to the local economic development of the country through taxation of profits from the cannabis industry, the health benefits users in, uh, for users in terms of the safety standards to be imposed, the relief on the healthcare system in terms of safety regulations to be imposed, and the relief on the justice system in terms of no longer having to incur the cost of prosecution for the sales of aforementioned cannabis. Furthermore, the plan of action should be to completely legalize cannabis to issue licenses for medical and recreational cultivation and sales, to impose a taxation system on cannabis sales to establish guidelines which cannabis cultivators uh, and sellers must adhere to, and to formulate policy which forces cultivators to adhere to standards and have their products tested by the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority before sales commence, as well as to have cultivators be subject to testing of their products at any given time. Fines should be imposed on cultivators that fail to adhere to standards and in serious offences their licences revoked in addition to these fines. And lastly, to establish educational programmes on the safe use of cannabis for users or for those intending to use. Thank you very much for your time. Here's my reference list to look over. And if there are any questions, I will attend to them as soon as possible. Have a great day ahead. Thank you so much. And Before I open for questions, I would just like for Mr. Duplessis, because the, our two last papers were position paper. So I just want Mr. Duplessis to give us the perspective about a position paper in an academic sphere. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a graveyard session. Uh, as she knows, the last session and all of our tired. But in terms of the position paper, when I do these assignments and the research projects in terms of the work that I'm doing, I don't know what the students will find. And that's that's the research. You don't know what answer you're going to get because you do research to find out. So ultimately, what the position paper entails is that students critically engage with the content, evaluate the arguments for a particular position, as well as an argument against. And by doing that is basically then analyzing and synthesizing the various strengths and weaknesses of a particular paper and drawing up a particular argument. Because the nice thing about policy is that there's no correct answer. It's not like maths one plus one is two. Policy can be different. You know, policies depend on the facts, the arguments that you gather uh, uh, to present your position to the uh, on a balance of probability, the best outcomes or the best benefits for adopting a particular position. But this needs to be substantiated. It should be, it should be, you know, embedded in literature. It should be, and that's why the students uh, adopted the particular. It should be informed. It should, it can't just be grabbed out of the air. Otherwise, that's not the literature. So ideally, that's the aim that we try to achieve with the position papers. Uh, interestingly, with these position papers. Uh, it gives them greater insight into things and they decide what they can do on any topic. So I don't give them a topic in my classes. They can do whatever they like. For me, it's not to give students topics, but we talked earlier that it are students uh, empty vessels. Do they come with without anything? Don't they have anything? So they can do anything they want in, in public policy. So I tell them, just do whatever you want. And then they come to me and ask me for guidelines. And I say, I don't know what you're going to do. I can't even give you guidelines. I don't know. So ultimately, it's up to the students. So students become more independent and they become more critically. 
and they engage to find the answers that they want to achieve. And, and I think with giving them a platform as we have now in this space, uh, is also now to, because this particular position paper, these videos that we have here, this will now be part of my classes, my next assignment. So these will be introduced and embedded. So students then in my class will critically engage with the arguments that was advanced here. So I promote the research. So the research do not end here, or it ends with the contributions of the students. So the idea is take it back, make it part of my classes, and hopefully get my next students to come and present and do a critical assessment of both and how things have changed. And maybe they come with additional remedies that, that one might need. Did I answer that question? You want more? <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't know if Doctor you want to say something on the, the first presentation. Well, um, thank you, colleagues. Uh, a bit to um, give an insight on um, Christopher et al's presentation because you realize that at the moment over a billion people don't have access to portable water and of that billion remember we have over just 7.7 .7 billion people in the world and when you actually get to the numbers you realize that a lot of people don't have access to portable water and then when you lower it down bringing it to the case of South Africa you're realizing that over 500 um thousand people don't have access to portable water. It sounds, uh, you know, out of reach because you have your tap open every day, you get access to water every day. Then when you boil it down to the low income households, you know, to the poor, then you realize that they don't even have water to drink, an actual cup of water to drink. So now when you bring in the nexus, you know, like uh, Chris indicated, when you bring in the nexus of the energy, then having a ripple effect on uh, the lack of water access, then you realize that we're sitting on a ticking time bomb, time bomb in South Africa because we've been having an energy crisis for the longest. And now we have a water crisis. And uh, the nexus then brings in, you know, a more difficult challenge, especially when you're reflecting back on the sustainable development goals, especially the one that it focuses on, which is sustainable development goal six on um, availability and accessibility of affordable water. So it is up to you and me and obviously the researchers, you know, out there on what are we doing, you know, to ensure that by 2030, hopefully, which is roughly six years from now, you know, we reach those targets that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals have, have set. You want to say something? Feel obliged now. Good afternoon, colleagues. <laughs> um, yes, we are very privileged to have such hardworking students and uh, who really take on the challenge to be part of research that looks at societal impact as well. And I think that's that's very important. Uh, the research presented uh, by the last two presenters or groups, they from undergraduate um, pro from our undergraduate program and third year students, and I I think there is really good opportunity for us even at an undergraduate level to already prepare our students and to look for students that can go into our postgraduate programs as well. So our assignments don't just become mere assignments for grading students, but there already we are introducing them to policy issues in South Africa. Um, regionally as well as globally, as particularly um, the topics that were presented here this afternoon as well. And uh, also the issues such as the, the water and the energy crisis as well. And uh, to make our students also realize that they also have a contribution in terms of the academic work that we are doing and what we are producing um, as researchers and as students, uh, undergraduate students or postgraduate students that we look at issues where we as academic institutions and departments and students and researchers can actually contribute to finding solutions to those particular societal challenges. And that is really what we are trying to instill in the programs that we are offering and the guidance that they are getting from our academics as well in our, in our programs and in our department as well. Because issues such as water, electricity, 
Um, it has not only have an impact on our, our citizens and communities, it's got a socioeconomic impact, impacts businesses, small businesses, and it's got also got an impact on the economy of the country. Yeah, and I think that as all that I want to say, and congratulations to all the students and um, the groups that presented and the researchers um, in this whole day and in the seminar as well. And then also thank you to the library. Uh, who is making this opportunity available for our students also to showcase the, the initiative that they are taking and the research that they are busy with. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mai. And then I will open for questions if there are questions. To Um, thank you, colleagues. Uh, there was a specific question um, that I wanted to, to ask with regard to the first presentation on the water, because it seems like either I felt like the presenter knew me personally because I live in Tennessee and I'm in the lying, high lying areas and I'm always affected. So I'm like, it looks like you're talking to me. But I was wondering and thinking to myself, uh, there were suggestions that renewable energy is used um, to ensure that the pumps keep pumping. I had the privilege, obviously, to, of being on the line of the pump. So at some stage, they didn't pull it off and I didn't get load shedding. But what one of the recommendations I would have thought that would have, would have been hydroelectric generation or hydropower. Because we have all this water, we have got the Victoria Falls, we've got the river flow strong. So it's actually just a comment that couldn't we use all this water flow to generate the water to keep the pumps going? Um, yes, thank you. That that was my input on that. Thank you. It's a, a common suggestion further in, uh, for, uh, for further investigation. Uh, I was just thinking of that uh, and so on. So it could be for further study to look into that option of using water to its own advantage. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Program Director. Uh, this is not a question, but a comment. Uh, the question was asked, what is good governance? in general, and specifically not in Mangao, uh, but uh, generally. And that proves that in South Africa, we don't have good governance anymore. That plays a big role that we should be aware of. And another uh, point is on the good government, on the good governance, who gets the tender? Does the person who's been offered a tender knows what to do? Does the person who gets the tender studied the discipline of water management? And it goes further because we have legislation that controls water uh, the, uh, the first one, which uh, uh, the United Nations, which is the mother body uh, internationally, and comes then the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, which also deals with uh, the basic need of shelter and water. Do we protect those rights of people who must have water as a basic need? No. Then to come and, uh, 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 and ask if maybe there were, or maybe I missed the point that did you try to find out who is sourcing the water from Gatsi Dam, which I know there was a project and is still going on. And secondly, who is sourcing water from Orange River? And lastly, another point, vandalism versus the security of our water pumps. Thank you.
<laughs> Just to comment, we always point a finger at the government. What are we doing? Because we are the people who are vandalizing our own resources. So we need to take an introspection. So we need to educate our communities. So the library can play a role there. Okay, Mana. Oh, okay. Um, it's not a question. I just want to say thank you very much for teaching us about the impact of uh, load shedding on water governance because it is a crisis in our country. And but it's so scary to learn about water shedding because I think it's worse than load shedding. And I really appreciate your effort. And then about cannabis. Um, <laughs> Legalizing it. Um, since I was young, I've seen um, police destroying huge fields of cannabis. And I don't think it is working. It's, it, it doesn't seem to be a solution. Maybe legalizing it um, as a creational or creational, yeah. And or a medicinal purpose, maybe it might help if they legalize it. And then about abortion, um, I look at abortion um, in a Christian way. So for me, it's, it's wrong. Um, maybe for other people, it's not. Unless if maybe there is a, a medical emergency or a need, uh, then it's fine. So thank you very much. Uh, that's all from me. to do and the colleague and the students that you presented with, you know, it was just um, insightful, you know, learning that from an undergraduate student. And then, you know, they open your your mind to so much because, for instance, I'll start with the, um, with the abortion presentation. So I'm not necessarily pro-life or pro-choice, but I'll say I'm pro-rational, okay? Because then in my mind, I saw the one last slide that was saying, um, Abortion shouldn't be because most of the times it's done for shallow reasons. So then in my head, I'm thinking, she just mentions Christianity, right? So then what happens if I'm not a Christian? What are, you know, the normatives around it? And then you bring it down to think, when you say a norm, it's a norm to who? Because norms apply based on your religion, based on your political um view based on your cultural view. So if you're saying you're pro-life because of a for particular norm, because you're Christian, because you know, you're from a particular culture, what is the norm? Who is the norm? You know, based on what reasons? Because just off my pro-rational logic, I would say possibly someone can abort if they're raped, if there's a you know a gestational issue before the fetus, not the child. Before the fetus grows, you indicated reasons on, um, you know, some people don't want to be single parents, some women want to, you know, further their careers. That's shallow based on the norm, but whose norm is it? So, I mean, I'm just bringing out those ideas just, you know, since you said you're going to use this, you know, for further research. And then the second one was on cannabis. Very interesting. Because last year when I was in Canada, I was very interested seeing that Canada was also, you know, on the list of countries that have uh, legalized uh, cannabis for recreational purposes. And then you throw all these figures, you know, indicating that there's a huge market and huge profits for cannabis. So if we are going to legalize it, what not better way for the government to actually, you know, put in all the tax implications and make money out of it, you know, because either way, it's still being used, it's still being grown. So why not the government then profit out of it? You know, and actually when we legalize it then, 
you know, there's no way for people to obviously abuse it. Then there's all, going to be all those quality assurances. Like you indicated, we see how much of it is being, you know, grown, how much of it should be grown for medicinal or for recreational purposes, et cetera. But it was a really, you know, eye-opening. Um, and also I noted another point was there's less deaths from cannabis than from alcohol and uh, cigarettes. But then we have more cigarettes on the market and more alcohol on the market, yet we have less deaths on cannabis. So, I mean, what are the, you know, uh, over and above implications of legalizing cannabis? But really interesting um, conversations, Mr. Duke. I like to get questions. I like to answer questions and I like to get questions. Interestingly, for me, what no, ultimately it's about philosophy. Uh, for me, it's philosophy of the mind. What is the mind and what constitutes the mind? What constitutes consciousness? And once you understand philosophy of the mind and you know, and, we, and, and it borders to decolonization of the mind, that remember when everything was created, like for example, if you look at the trends in the relations to, 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 to a particular worldview or how I see the world through a particular prism or lens, it was ultimately constructed, you know, so, so baby is born into a particular norms and standards. So consciousness is born into consciousness. So consciousness then evolved in a particular norm. But that poses serious challenges in terms of controversy. And that's why I said to my students, I want a controversial topic. There will always be arguments for and arguments arguments again. And it doesn't mean the arguments against is wrong or the arguments for is wrong. Ultimately, you, you move from a particular philosophical perspective for you to arrive at a particular point. But only, and I like what you say, you're not pro-choice, pro-life, you're pro-rationalization. What does that imply? Evidence-based policy. Right? So evidence, so you will embed it in terms of evidence. And ultimately, the idea is that, that we do not take uh, emotional decisions, uh, ideological decisions. Uh, uh, sometimes it borders on, on populism. But, but, but what about evidence? Remember, how we see in the world, a couple of years can leave these guys, the, the flat earth phenomenon, the earth is flat. And, you, and everyone believed that the earth was flat. Until recently, we believed that Plato is a planet. So, so Plato is a planet. It was, it's now a dwarf planet, it, it, but we believe, and everyone believed, all the scientists, all, everyone, everyone was taught that, that Plato was a planet. But now they say, no, it's no longer a planet, it's a dwarf planet. So ultimately, we need to look at the science and we need to look at the embedded philosophy if that's your point of departure, you can then unravel these issues in terms of where we need to go from at least from a philosophical perspective. Then in terms of cannabis, <clears throat> cannabis, I think the student did an excellent job in terms of conducting the analysis. Ideally, I would approach it cost-benefit analysis again with the cost-benefit analysis and again with stigmas. Remember, weed, taha, marijuana, ganja, Regardless of what you call it, I don't smoke it. Just to, just I don't smoke it. I don't drink. So I'm not going to tell anyone to smoke or drink. But these things has been stigmatized. Stigmatized. I like what Bob Marley said. I'm a Rasta. If you guys don't know it, Bob Marley said all governments are illegal. And and ultimately, you ask the question: Who decided what is legal and what is illegal? And if if, if that's a philosophical question that you ask, you need to ponder on a philosophical issue to say whether I'm arriving at the decision from a philosophical point of view, but ultimately, is it the right view? Now, recently, again, you can, you can expand this philosophy of the mind even further, you know, even constructed viewpoints of what constitute. These days, we, we, we have non-binary viewpoints. So, so ultimately, remember, we were trapped in a binary way of thinking or categorical way of thinking. The idea, especially with Einstein's equation, that uh, MC uh, theory of relativity, uh, that, that we try to see the world in the social sciences from a natural science perspective. But in the world, it's not billiard balls. It's not up or down. 
or left or right. It's non-binary approaches to how we constitute or how we conceive reality. And how we conceive reality, that's what reality is. Remember, money means nothing. If I can give you paper money, I give it to someone in the Amazon jungle. Here's money. It doesn't mean anything for him. It doesn't have value. A value emerged in the mind. So we give value to something because we agree. But if we do not agree, does it exist? That's deeply philosophical. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Beyond. Thank you, Mr. Duplessis. He always has these very deep discussions when he enters your office. <laughs> um, I like to comment about the uh, first presentation about the good governance. And the question that Mr. Monatori then posed back was, but should we as a, a society not also have a role in terms of how are we protecting our resources, right? Our infrastructure resources, the infrastructure that government provides us with, because in any case, it's provided with our tax money. We are taxpayers and we pay for that. But as much as we want to keep um, government accountable, we have a role to play in terms of how we exert and require that accountability from government as society. And the research that we are doing, what we are say as ordinary citizens, how we are um, electing our next government. We are now approaching the elections. Um, all of that has got a role to play in terms of how do we as citizens, as knowledge partners, as institutions, as academics, as ordinary citizens, how are we keeping our, our government accountable, our municipalities as well? in terms of how they are taking care of these resources and how they are spending our taxpayers' money as well. And the importance of research from a policy perspective, of course, and I think we would all agree on that, is in terms of evidence-based decisions, because we want government to provide policy and to deliver services informed by policy, informed by evidence and as in uh, higher education institutions, as researchers, we have a very important role to play in terms of how do we inform and direct the policy agenda. And I want to conclude with this. So we have a conference the first week of July. It's our International Discipline Association for Public Administration and Management. And some of the research that's presented here today um, I think it's a very good platform also for you to attend and to present that particular research, your particular research um, at such a particular uh, conference as well. It's an international conference with um, representatives, researchers, uh, practitioners, civil society organizations from across the world. And we have um, representatives as part of the management board of um, this particular uh, association, ASIA, that even serves on the United Nations. So it's really an opportunity to influence uh, government agenda regionally, locally, as well as internationally as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Time, Mr. Thank you. Yes, I'm not very philosophical or clever or whatever, but after listening to all of this, the word responsibility comes to mind. We all have responsibility. The government has a responsibility. The same with the use of tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis. We have a responsibility, and with um, abortion. Uh, we have a responsibility. Um, before you, um, okay, I'm sorry now, um, before you do the deed, you have the responsibility to think um, what are the consequences um, if I'm not married, if I don't, I can't raise a child on my own, what, what, whatever. So to me, 
everything that was presented here, the word responsibility comes to mind. And that is how I summed this all up. Um, yeah, so that's all my comment. Thanks. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Before I call the program director, uh, the highlights that we have seen from our students since this morning up until now, we have seen uh, academic competence, critical thinking, and ethical reason. So I would like to applaud our students for their good work. Thank you very much, you know, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spogot. Thank you to our academic panelists there. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our sessions, all seven of them. Um, I'd like to say well done to all the students, well done to all the presentations. It was indeed um, stimulating, very passionate, and um, yeah, thought-provoking as well. And when I was sitting there listening to some of the program statements, I was thinking, where are the fellow entrepreneurs? Um, because some of these challenges are actually um, solution orientated also if you listen to the conclusions and if one is ready to put them into practice, one could have a lucrative business as well. Um, I'd like to call on Mr. Lashan um, to come and give um, the vote of thanks before we can go to the award ceremony. And just to say, um, the UFS Liz um, aim for this day was to cultivate academic excellence by inspiring students to produce scholarly outputs of high standard. And I think we are a witness of that today. The introduction of the Liz undergraduate and honors research seminar Liz has award seems a fitting method for affirming our students and also affording them with this opportunity to showcase their academic work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lashan Naika. Thank you, Program Director. And good afternoon, colleagues. I know it's the last day of term. It's a Friday afternoon. And the last topic for the present for this seminar was on cannabis. So I'm not sure whether it was purposely then. <laughs> so yeah. A good afternoon to all of you again. Uh, on behalf of the Library and Information Services, I would like to thank you all for attending this event. Uh, you have contributed to the success of this event. As we look at Vision 130. And the tenets of Vision 130 speaks to academic excellence, speaks to societal impact and inclusivity. I think if you look at the seminar, it speaks to all three of those of the tenets. Academic excellence. When you listen to the presentations, then you realize we are there. We said we always say we're working towards academic excellence. I think we are there already. If you look at the at the caliber of the presentations, I think we are there already. So that the students, I want to say well done. I think let's give them a applause for that. To our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Vasu Reddy, uh, I would like to thank him for his unwavering support of this event, and I think his speech this morning was recorded, so it was played. I think even there, he speaks to academic excellence, and I think it's driven throughout the university. So I think I just want to thank him for his support. To the director of the library services, Ms. Monopiane, this, this brainchild started as the best assignment project when she was the deputy director, and now it's, it has evolved into the Liz Hurst Seminar. So I want to thank you and thank you for your support for this event. Thank you, Ms. Malampian. To, to the esteemed guest speaker, Prof. Zondi, 
who is brand new to the university, I would like to express our gratitude for your inspiring words on his student-centered university. I think her passion for students is there, and I think she her, her goal is to focus on students. And I think she even mentioned that if it wasn't for students, we won't be here. So I think that's an important thing. To our academics, I want to say thank you. If it wasn't for you, marking those assignments and submitting them, we wouldn't have had this project. So thank to all the, thank you to all the academics that have contributed to this project. So I think next year is going to be a two-day event. It's too long for one day. It's too it's a bit too much. So I think next year we'll have to extend it for a two-day program. To the adjudicators, they're not here now. They're still telling the votes. So I think I just say thank you to them. It's a hard job for the adjudicators to work on presentations that are of such high standard. It's very difficult to judge. To the technology team, you'll see them sitting in front here. These are the people that work behind the scenes and they've done a wonderful job with live streaming and the sound system. So thank you, Mayor. We give them a round of applause, please. Lastly, I would like to thank my team. That's the teaching and learning team. I'd like them to come to the front, please. I think this project is part of the teaching and learning, so I'd like the faculty librarians. They've been liaising with the faculties, liaising with the, with the students. I would like you to come to the front, so please. So this is the team that did all the planning for this event. Yeah, so this is the team that did all the planning for the event. So I think they've been running around for the past month, all the shouting and everything in between, and that they've done a wonderful job, I think. <laughs> we have a fun one. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. In closing, I'd like to extend my sincerest appreciation to everyone in making the seminar a memorable, a memorable and enriching experience. Your collective efforts have not gone unnoticed, and I'm confident that, that the knowledge gained here will continue to inspire the academic pursuits of the university and, and to inspire up and coming students during third year and and honors. I think you will be the inspiration to the other students. So I thank you once again. And I'm going to hand you over to the program director before we start the award ceremony. OK. Um, cannabis, it's Friday. They say Hadid, is it true? I once attended a an event in Prague, a tour actually in Bruno Praha via Paris. And as we got to the South African embassy in Prague, the main trees that were that were at the embassy were cannabis trees. And we asked, well, we were with a couple of um, uh, Rastafarians, so they got very excited and we didn't understand. It's like, you know, they got a, a sugar rush of some sort and we couldn't understand what is this reaction about? So they're like, this is unbelievable. So they went inside and they inquired, first of all, if it was legal. And what was the reason for the cannabis trees? And the answer was that it's one of the most effective trees to assist with pollution. So it goes to climate change and the first presentation that we had on climate change and um, some of the solutions um, could be culminating from Hadij. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we are just waiting for our adjudicators to come through with their results so that we can resume our last session of the award ceremony. 
but as we wait, um, the the gentleman who did um, a presentation around wheat, as he was presenting, I remember that I have a whole book um, dedicated to seeds. It's called Bear or Planters. But it's philosophical, of course. It's not the actual seeds. And as he was presenting, I jot down something. And it's called Toxic Seeds. So discard the toxic seeds. For it could be the pain wrapped in seasons, unperformable, overgrown scars, restores sanity, survival lessons harvested, linked to love, redemption. Your tree of joy prunes those you love. Besides, you bloom differently when you plant on hilled lands. Are we ready? The moment we've all been waiting for is finally here. So we shall be starting with the third group. And um, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. The LIS HERS 2024 Library and Information Services Honors and Undergraduate Research Seminar. And uh, we would then like to recognize and appreciate the contribution of Christopher Stradon. And uh, Tato Chawalala. And lastly, Namira Bade. Congratulations, Mr. Stradog. And of course, for Tato and Namira, um, they shall receive them um, through their faculties. Thank you. And for the second group. For the second place. We would like to recognize and appreciate the contribution of Nom Tanda Zozondi. Is she here? They're all not here. Okay. All right. Let's just mention their name and uh, Anna Mokosho will then assist with their handover. Kaitlin Whitehawk. Marina Nell. Jacko Lottering, Frit Latakhan, Hannah Brody, and lastly, Marisa Stander.
And thank you. And that was knowledge contribution into the health sciences. And these are our first places. And we would like to recognize and appreciate Maria Smith, Faculty of Humanities. And Tande Kile Punene, also from Humanities. Another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank <laughs> <laughs> As you should be. Okay, these are the, the third and the second individuals. We would like to recognize and appreciate Njabani Alfred Njabani, Faculty of Natural and Agriculture and Science. And uh, N.E. Barkhazen. Congratulations, and that's the second place. And for the first place, <laughs> no, they're still here. She's joining in. For the first place, um, let's congratulate Mamela Rose Masia, Faculty of Law. Oh, yes. Another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Well done. Thank you. Uh, please note that your prizes will be sent to you in due course to all my second and first runner and all the certificates that are dated shall also be sent to you in due course. Thank you. It seems like most of our people um, who made their submissions, they're not here. So all the certificates and all the trophies, they will be sent to them, right? Sufficient, 
We have two hands. And if the academics are here. The third hand. Ford. Fifth. So the fifth people are, at least five people are here. You can come, you can come to the front, we'll take a picture. Thank you very much. One more trophy, one more trophy as we settle down. The floating trophy then goes to the Faculty of Humanities for a huge number of entries and submissions. May we have all the academic, uh, uh, the academics who are here to come forward, please. Any academic from from humanities who's here? All the humanities students. Humanities students. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Mitchellette. Thank you, Lasha. Um, and congratulations to all the, the winners and uh, everybody who submitted. Um, we're looking forward to reading those submissions on some of the journals. And um, well done. This is the end of our Lewis Harris 2024. Agent. Please, there's a link to check out everybody that was released. Please give us your comments, positive and some suggestions. We'd like to do this budget. Thank you Thank you.
Essa <laughs> <laughs>